Section two of a Popular History of France, Volume four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume four by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter twenty eight. Francis I and Charles V, Part two. On the thirteenth of September, fifteen fifteen, about midday, the constable de Bourbon gave notice to the king, encamped at Melignano, a town about three leagues from Milan, that the Swiss, sallying in large masses from Milan, at the noisy summons of the bull of Uri and the cow of Unterwalden, were advancing to attack. The king, who was purposing to sit down to supper, left it on the spot, and went off straight towards the enemy, who were already engaged in skirmishing, which lasted a long while before they were at the great game. The king had great numbers of lansknechts, the which would fain have done a bold deed in crossing a ditch to go after the Swiss. But these latter let seven or eight ranks cross, and then thrust you them back in such a sort that all that had crossed got hurled into the ditch. The said lansknechts were mightily frightened, and, but for the aid of a troop of men-at-arms, amongst the which was the good knight Bayard, who bore down right through the Swiss, there had been a sad disaster there for it was now night, and night knows no shame. A band of Swiss came passing in front of the king, who charged them gallantly. There was heavy fighting there and much danger to the king's person, for his great boof, the top of the visor of his helmet, was pierced, so as to let in daylight by the thrust of a pike. It was now so late that they could not see one another, and the Swiss were, for this evening, forced to retire on the one side, and the French on the other. They lodged as they could, but well I know that none did rest at ease. The king of France put as good a face on matters as the least of all his soldiers did, for he remained all night a horseback like the rest. According to other accounts, he had little sleep, lying on a gun carriage. On the morrow at daybreak the Swiss were for beginning again, and they came straight towards the French artillery, from which they had a good peppering. Howbeit, never did men fight better, and the affair lasted three or four good hours. At last they were broken and beaten, and there were left on the field ten or twelve thousand of them. The remainder, in pretty good order along the high road, withdrew to Milan, whither they were pursued sword in hand. From Histoire du Bon Chevalier dans Pieux et Sans Reproche, pages 99 to 102. The very day after the battle Francis I wrote to his mother, the regent, a long account, alternately ingenuous and eloquent, in which the details are set forth with all the complacency of a brave young man, who is speaking of the first great affair in which he has been engaged, and in which he did himself honor. The victory of Melignano was the most brilliant day in the annals of this reign. Old Marshal Trivulzio, who had taken part in seventeen battles, said that this was a strife of giants, besides which all the rest were but child's play. On the very battlefield, before making and creating knights of those who had done him good service, Francis I was pleased to have himself made knight by the hand of Bayard. Sir, said Bayard, the king of so noble a realm, he who has been crowned, consecrated and anointed with oil set down from heaven, he who is the eldest son of the church, is knight over all other knights. Bayard, my friend, said the king, make haste, we must have no laws or canons quoted here, do my bidding. Assuredly, sir, said Bayard, I will do it, since it is your pleasure. And taking his sword, Avail it as much, said he, as if I were Roland or Oliver, Godfrey or his brother Baldwin. Please God, sir, that in war you may never take flight. And holding up his sword in the air, he cried, Assuredly, my good sword, thou shalt be well guarded as a relic and honored above all others, for having this day conferred upon so handsome and puissant a king the order of chivalry, and never will I wear thee more, if it be not against Turks, Moors, and Saracens. Whereupon he gave two bounds and thrust his sword into the sheath. From Les Tests de la Vie du Chevalier Bayard, by Champier, in the Archive Curis de l'Histoire de France, page 160. The effect of the victory of Melignano was great, in Italy primarily, but also throughout Europe. It was at the commencement of a new reign, and under the impulse communicated by a young king, an event which seemed to be decisive and likely to remain so for a long while. Of all the sovereigns engaged in the Italian league against Francis I, 
he who was most anxious to appear temperate and almost neutral, namely, Leo X, was precisely he who was most surprised and most troubled by it. When he knew that a battle was on the eve of being fought between the French and the Swiss, he could not conceal his anxiety and his desire that the Swiss might be victorious. The Venetian ambassador at Rome, Marino Giorgi, whose feelings were quite the other way, took in his diplomatic capacity a malicious pleasure in disquieting him. "'Holy Father,' said he, "'the most Christian king is there in person with the most warlike and best appointed of armies. The Swiss are afoot and ill-armed, and I am doubtful of their gaining the day.' "'But the Swiss are valiant soldiers, are they not?' said the Pope. "'Were it not better, Holy Father,' rejoined the ambassador, "'that they should show their valour against the infidel?' When the news of the battle arrived, the ambassador in grand array repaired to the popes, and the people who saw him passing by in such state said, The news is certainly true. On reaching the pope's apartment, the ambassador met the chamberlain, who told him that the Holy Father was still asleep. Wake him, said he, but the other refused. Do as I tell you, insisted the ambassador. The chamberlain went in, and the pope, only half-dressed, soon sallied from his room. Holy Father, said the Venetian, your holiness yesterday gave me some bad news which was false to-day i have to give you some good news which is true the swiss are beaten the pope read the letters brought by the ambassador and some other letters also what will come of it for us and for you asked the pope for us was the answer nothing but good since we are with the most christian king and your holiness will not have aught of evil to suffer sir ambassador rejoined the pope we will see what the most christian king will do we will place ourselves in his hands, demanding mercy of him. Holy Father, your holiness will not come to the least harm, any more than the Holy See. Is not the most Christian king the church's own son? And in the account given of this interview to the Senate of Venice, the ambassador added, The Holy Father is a good sort of man, a man of great liberality and of a happy disposition, but he would not like the idea of having to give himself much trouble." Leo X made up his mind, without much trouble, to accept accomplished facts. When he had been elected Pope, he had said to his brother, Julian de' Medici, Enjoy the papacy, since God hath given it to us. He appeared to have no further thought than how to pluck from the event the advantages he could discover in it. His allies all set him an example of resignation. On the 15th of September, the day after the battle, the Swiss took the road back to their mountains. Francis I entered Milan in triumph. Maximilian Sforza took refuge in the castle, and twenty days afterwards, on the 4th of October, surrendered, consenting to retire to France with a pension of thirty thousand crowns, and the promise of being recommended for a cardinal's hat, and almost consoled for his downfall, by the pleasure of being delivered from the insolence of the Swiss, the exactions of the Emperor Maximilian, and the rascalities of the Spaniards. Fifteen years afterwards, in June 1530, he died in oblivion at Paris. Francis I regained possession of all Milanes, adding thereto, with the Pope's consent, the duchies of Parma and Piacenza, which had been detached from it in 1512. Two treaties, one of November 7, 1515, and the other of November 29, 1516, re-established not only peace, but perpetual alliance, between the King of France and the thirteen Swiss cantons, with stipulated conditions in detail. Whilst these negotiations were in progress, Francis I and Leo X, by a treaty published at Viterbo on the 13th of October, proclaimed their hearty reconciliation. The Pope granted to Francis I the Duchy of Milan, restored to him those of Parma and Piacenza, and recalled his troops which were still serving against the Venetians, being careful, however, to cover his concessions by means of forms and pretexts which gave them the character of a necessity submitted to, rather than that of an independent and definite engagement. Francis I, on his side, guaranteed to the Pope all the possessions of the Church, renounced the patronage of the petty princes of the ecclesiastical estate, and promised to uphold the family of the Medici in the position it had held at Florence since, with the King of Spain's aid, in 1512, it had recovered the dominion there at the expense of the party of Republicans and Friends of France. The King of France and the Pope had to discuss, together, questions far more important on both sides, than those which had just been thus settled by their accredited agents. When they signed the Treaty of Viterbo, it was agreed that the two sovereigns should have a personal interview, at which they should come to an arrangement upon points of which they had as yet said nothing. 
Rome seemed the place most naturally adapted for this interview, but the Pope did not wish that Francis I should go and display his triumph there. Besides, he foresaw that the king would speak to him about the kingdom of Naples, the conquest of which was evidently premeditated by the king, and when Francis I, having arrived at Rome, had already done half of the journey, Leo X feared that it would be more difficult to divert him. He resolved to make to the king a show of deference to conceal his own disquietude, and offered to go and meet him at Bologna, the town in the Roman states which was nearest to Milaness. Francis accepted the offer. The Pope arrived at Bologna on the 8th of December, 1515, and the king the next day. After the public ceremonies, at which the king showed eagerness to tender to the Pope acts of homage, which the Pope was equally eager to curtail without repelling them, the two sovereigns conversed about the two questions which were uppermost in their minds. Francis did not attempt to hide his design of reconquering the kingdom of Naples, which Ferdinand the Catholic had wrongfully usurped, and he demanded the Pope's countenance. The Pope did not care to refuse, but he pointed out to the king that everything foretold the very near death of King Ferdinand, and, Your Majesty, said he, will then have a natural opportunity for claiming your rights, and as for me, free, I shall then be, from my engagements with the King of Aragorn in respect to the crown of Naples, I shall find it easier to respond to Your Majesty's wish. The Pope merely wanted to gain time. Francis, setting aside for the moment the kingdom of Naples, spoke of Charles the Seventh's pragmatic sanction, and the necessity of putting an end to the difficulties which had arisen on this subject between the court of Rome and the kings of France, his predecessors. As to that, said the Pope, I could not grant what your predecessors demanded, but be not uneasy. I have a compensation to propose to you which will prove to you how dear your interests are to me. The sovereigns had, without doubt, already come to an understanding on this point, when after a three days' interview with Leo X, Francis I returned to Milan, leaving at Bologna, for the purpose of treating in detail the affair of the pragmatic sanction, his Chancellor Duprat, who had accompanied him during all this campaign as his adviser and negotiator. In him the king had, under the name and guise of premier magistrate of the realm, a servant whose bold and complacent abilities he was not slow to recognize and to put in use. Being irritated, for that many, not having the privilege of sportsmen, do take beasts, both red and black, as hares, pheasants, partridges, and other game, thus frustrating us of our diversion and pastime that we take in the chase, Francis I issued, in March 1516, an ordinance which decreed against poachers the most severe penalties, and even death, and which granted to all princes, lords, and gentlemen possessing forests or warrens in the realm, the right of upholding therein by equally severe punishments the exclusive privileges of their preserves. The Parliament made remonstrances against such excessive rigor, and refused to register the ordinance. The Chancellor, Duprat, insisted and even threatened, to the king alone, said he, belongs the right of regulating the administration of his state. Obey, or the king will see in you only rebels, whom he will know how to chastise. For a year the Parliament held out, but the Chancellor persisted more obstinately in having his way, and on the 11th of February, 1517, the ordinance was registered under a formal order from the king, to which the name was given of Letters of Command. At the commencement of the war for the conquest of Milaness there was a want of money, and Francis I hesitated to so soon impose new taxes. Duprat gave a scandalous extension to a practice which had been for a long while in use, but had always been reprobated and sometimes formally prohibited, namely, the sale of public appointments or offices. Not only did he create a multitude of financial and administrative offices, the sale of which brought considerable sums into the treasury, but he introduced the abuse into the very heart of the judicial body. The tribunals were encumbered by newly created magistrates. The estates of Languedoc complained in vain. The Parliament of Paris was, in its turn, attacked. In 1521, three councillors, recently nominated, were convicted of having paid, one, three thousand eight hundred livres, and the two others six thousand livres. The Parliament refused to admit them. Duprat protested. The necessities of the state, he said, made borrowing obligatory, and the king was free to prefer in his selections those of his subjects who showed most zeal for his service. Parliament persisted in its refusal. Duprat resolved to strike a great blow. 
an edict of January 31, 1522, created within the Parliament a fourth chamber, composed of eighteen councillors and two presidents, all of fresh and no doubt venal appointment, though the edict dared not avow as much. Two great personages, the Archbishop of Aix and Marshal de Montmorency, were charged to present the edict to Parliament and require its registration. The Parliament demanded time for deliberation. It kept an absolute silence for six weeks, and at last presented an address to the Queen Mother, trying to make her comprehend the harm such acts did to the importance of the magistracy and to her son's government. Louise appeared touched by these representations, and promised to represent their full weight to the king, if the Parliament will consent to point out to me of itself any other means of readily raising the sum of one hundred and twenty thousand livres, which the king absolutely cannot do without. The struggle was prolonged until the Parliament declared that it could not, without offending God and betraying its own conscience, proceed to the registration, but that if it were the king's pleasure to be obeyed at any price, he had only to depute his chancellor or some other great personage, in whose presence and on whose requirement the registration should take place. Chancellor Duprat did not care to undertake this commission in person. Count de Saint-Paul, governor of Paris, was charged with it, and the court caused to be written at the bottom of the letters of command, read and published in presence of Count de Saint-Paul, specially deputed for this purpose, who ordered viva voce in the king's name that they be executed. End of section 2